If someone has ever said the following to you, then you know you're dealing with a narcissistic douchebag. Don't be on the wrong side of history. That's because, despite how easy it is to look back over the course of human history, for all the progress that's been made, it's a highly simplistic mind that thinks everything was a black and white fight between good and evil. After all, it doesn't make you a genius to say slavery is bad when you've grown up in a time where human rights, evolution, and even critical thinking are full-fledged sciences and schools of thought. But it's an even simpler mind that assumes they'll be looked back on favorably by future historians. If you can't even know how what you're doing right now will affect your life in a week from today, and let's be honest, how many of you can even remember what you had for breakfast, then it seems pretty egotistical to think that you can hedge your bets on where society will end up in decades or centuries in the future. Yet, how awesome would it be to get a glimpse of what future historians would think of us? That's why plenty of historians and even evolutionary biologists have started to build out maps on how to predict what future historians will think of us in the present moment. And by the present, I mean that the moment you're watching this, not the moment I'm writing this script or editing this video or even, you know what, never mind. These maps are predicated on the areas of human society which see the most radical change. Technology, living standards, politics, philosophy, and war. So, it's time to learn how history works to find out what historians in a hundred years will find crazy about the way we live today, and we'll start by looking at the mistakes of previous historians. The futurists of the Victorian era lay out the fundamentals of human thinking when it comes to predicting the future. Now, but better. The wild drawings and far out science fiction of the day showed that people were anticipating commercial flight and electric powered entertainment, but they envisioned hot air balloons, blimps, and even personal wings, the steampunk equivalent of jetpacks. Granted, these are a far cry from planes, helicopters, and even hoverboards, but we can't be too hard on them. We often make fun of them for using lead as a sweetener or a makeup ingredient, but we don't realize how stupid we are with plastics now. But I digress. This reveals the first clue about what we get wrong. Our concept of how to improve things is hindered by our own technology. We see this again in 1950s Americans. Visions of moon settlements showed white picket fences, Jetson-style space helmets, and once again, jetpacks. And in the modern day, what do concepts of the future look like? Sleek, curvaceous skyscrapers integrated with smart technology, biotechnology, and personal flying machines. Man, we gotta get over this idea of jetpacks. Time for a pop quiz. Does this trend show that we have outgrown our habits for conceptualizing the future or not? Answer, not a chance. Undoubtedly, future historians will roll their eyes at us, but what is really going to grind their gears is how inseparable we've become from tech. Our period is one of smart devices and dumb people. Everything is smart now. Phones, TVs, even my fridge connects to the Wi-Fi now. Don't ask me why. The only thing left is doors, like in Ubik by famed sci-fi genius Philip K. Dick, where your apartment will stay locked until you personally pay your door. As much as all of this integration has undoubtedly had benefits and enriched human connection, you wouldn't be getting a Nobel Prize for pointing out that it's come with some drawbacks. Neuroscientists have had some credible fears about how reliance on tech for communication, social connection, and short-form entertainment will have devastating impacts on our dopamine production, that's the happy chemical in your brain, and long-term concentration. And getting out of the matrix is no easy feat. Everyone is so integrated now, including culture. The social pressure to be on and connected means rebelling against this conditioning is seen as some novel retreat to tradition. But it's not. It's just that we don't need to spend hours on TikTok. Undoubtedly, historians will mark us down as the first time in our species history where our own computer technology became inseparable from typical human experience, but not in a cool cyborg way. We've made our lives worse at the cost of making things easier, and yet our vision of the future is some clean cityscape where, ironically, the people inhabiting these biodomes of the future are not glued to their screen? Anyway, what about our standards of living? Theoretically, if you had a phone with a signal on a desert island, you could survive. You're not short of websites or apps to work from home, and now home delivery is standard across any serious business. You can book order groceries, see a doctor, and even get laid without interacting with another human being, and this reduction of inconvenience is accessible to anyone who has a smartphone. 
So, even though there is still a divide between the rich and the poor, even some broke dude in an overcrowded Indian ghetto can watch the same Netflix show as an isolated oil tycoon in some Alaskan peninsula. We are truly living in an age of luxury abundance, but we've convinced ourselves that we're missing out, because A, these luxuries are digital, even though the effects are tangible, and B, some stranger on Instagram appears to have a better life. To be fair, it is great when social media creates positive change, and it is wonderful that electric cars are replacing polluting vehicles, but I can't imagine a single luxury more underappreciated than free education. For most of humankind, people were born in ignorance and died in ignorance. Now we have high-speed wireless internet giving you access to an endless supply of videos, essays, and journals. You can literally become an expert in anything by watching Harvard lectures on your phone, getting the latest news on your screen, and even outsourcing your business work to skilled workers across the globe. We have more knowledge now at our fingertips than a scholar 500 years ago ever had in their life. And are we thankful for it? Are we humble? Are we even using it? I mean, sure, you're here, don't forget to subscribe, but the fact that we would still rather watch cat videos and the Kardashians will not go unnoticed by those who come after us. That brings us nicely to politics. We're living in a globalized world where the concept of the nation state is being eroded by people tweeting their opinions on other countries' policies. Now, that's not to say that you can't have an opinion on international affairs, but when you compare the East to which we assume people give a rat's ass about what we think to any other time in history, it makes us look like narcissists. Protests are performance now. Placards are designed to go viral with jokes and in-jokes. It seems everyone is protesting everything all the time. Does retweeting Amazon's Pride tweet really mean anything? It doesn't, but we think it does because we're obsessed with an image. Politicians no longer speak to their people, but are conscious of an international audience, while our access to them is one-to-one. -one. Okay, sure, the only politician who actually ran their Twitter account personally was Donald Trump, but now you're only one PR team away from Obama, the Pope, the Queen, and Putin. Does Putin have a Twitter? Maybe he's a TikTok guy. And political parties are taking note of this. They're more receptive to their public image than ever before. Yet policy-wise, there is a concern about focusing on what is trending, which results in short-term policies. And who can blame them? Political discourse has worsened. People are canceled, doxxed, and threatened for spending even an inch out of line. Voters are more emotive than ever, as the election of Trump and Brexit referendum showed. And it seems a single-issue vote is just one meme away from a victory or defeat. Add to that a resurgence of identity politics, like the clashes between women's rights and trans rights, and it paints a much different picture from the introspective, considerate times of ancient Greece and even 1960s radicalism. Tech might have brought us together, but we've moved apart, and our current political climate will not be envied by any sane person from any time period. Philosophy is a nice segue here. Buzzwords like fake news and my truth all betray a society moving towards subjectivity and away from impartiality. Throw in a healthy mix of echo chambers and algorithms, and it would seem like the next thing history keepers will be taking strong note of is a complete breakdown of objectivity. But let's not be all doom and gloom. Amongst this headache of division, there are a few things of good coming out of it. The seismic shift towards green concerns marks a deep introspection on the consequences of industrialization. Yes, there will also be LA yoga teachers promoting some new food trend, but let's give us some slack. Electric cars are a thing now. Renewable energy is making strides. Recycling and veganism have picked up steam, and every corporation knows that its client base is expecting some degree of environmental responsibility. It's a rather revealing paradox that as our tech drives us apart, we find a unifying solace in returning to nature. Now, have we made enough progress? Well, that depends on whether the historians of tomorrow are living in biodomes or underwater. If it's the latter, then we will be lambasted for our slow reactions. But if it's the former, we will be mocked for our hysterical overreaction like a world of chicken littles. Either way. It seems we are destined to get a bad grade for our treatment of the planet. And finally, we have war. Thomas Sowell once said that the oldest thing is the concept of new, and Solid Snake even chimed in with, war never changes. But as much as conflict will always be with us, I think it's fair to say that post 9-11, the world has a new combat rulebook. Every war is international now, thanks to groups of allied nations, united nations, and good old-fashioned rivalries.
But the way the military is evolving suggests that battles won't be fought over land, but ideas. Advances in the US, Chinese, and Japanese Navy seem to anticipate heated tensions in the Pacific Oceans. And with China becoming such a big economic player, then it suggests a confrontation is inevitable. The Middle East remains a proxy war between Russia and the US, until oil is no longer needed, in which case we'll be gearing up for a fight over lithium. Meanwhile, despite some redrawing of borders, countries seem more or less to be interested in joining clubs, at least in the developed world. The eras of closed off empires fighting on their own soil for their own people are gone, will be remembered for being a time when one country's soldiers died for another country's membership in a continental pact. Okay, maybe that's far too cynical and poetic than it needs to be, but I think you get my picture. War is about business now, and the motivations are murky, hidden, and always shifting. So let's answer the question once and for all. What will historians hate about us in a hundred years? They will hate us for our entitlement, laziness, isolation, childishness, selfishness, and narcissism. So basically the same things that historians hate about people 100 years ago. But one question I've always had is why historians tend to remember the rich. Well, the good news is we have the answer. Go and watch my video on it to learn more. As always, make sure to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.